Hi, this is Amy Akers. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Angioma Alliance, and I'm here today having a conversation with Doug Marchuk. Doug is a James B. Duke Professor of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology at Duke University. He's also Director of the Division of Human Genetics there, and one of the founding members of the Angioma Alliance Scientific Advisory Board. And near and dear to my heart, he was also my PhD thesis advisor while I was at Duke um, for, as a grad student. So we're just going to have a discussion today and talk a little bit about CCM research. Um, his lab is focused on the genetics of cardiovascular diseases. Um, he and his group has been involved in so many different aspects of CCM research, going back to gene identification, lots of molecular work, and now um, they're doing lots and lots of drug studies with the mouse models um, that he also developed. So I'm going to stop talking and I want to ask um, Dr. Marchuk to tell us how did you become involved in CCM research? Yeah, you know, I heard about CCM from a number of colleagues, and then I became friends with Eric Johnson and Leslie Morrison, who's a pediatric neurologist in, in New Mexico, who you know very well. And these people told me all about the disease and the families they had collected. So we started our genetic studies with um, Leslie's uh, families that she had collected and Eric's families. Uh, so Eric's families, I think, came mostly from the Phoenix, Arizona area. And Leslie's obviously came from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I think actually all, all throughout New Mexico. So talking about disease and then get, having some good colleagues and friends, people who became friends, that's how I got started. Cool. That's great. That's great. So t let's talk a little bit more about um, families. So CCM families, you know, oftentimes, multi obviously, CCM comes in two different flavors, sporadic and familial. And the familial, when we have multiple lesions and or multiple family members affected in different generations, folks often go for genetic testing. If they come back negative for genetic testing, what, what does that tell you? What, what do you? Can you talk about that a little bit? How, why, how someone could still have familial CCM but come up negative on genetic testing? Yeah, one of the big issues is, is the diagnostic laboratories are very conservative. They are very hesitant to call something a mutation that they're pretty sure is a mutation, but they don't have rock solid evidence. And there's a series of rules that you would go by by seeing, you know, reading a sequence of a gene and and sort of claiming that that change that you found is a mutation. So often they have an idea that they found something, but they're not able to report it because of these rules. And, and in fairness, they, they should not. So that's the first thing is that I think there's a, there's a fair number of families who probably, you know, have one of those mutations, but, but it doesn't meet certain criteria to bona fide call a mutation. They're probably what are they, 80% sure, 70%, 90%, whatever, whatever it would be, and I don't know the, the actual numbers there in every case, but they're not able to call it. I think the other thing is, is we as scientists don't understand all the rules of how a DNA change can influence a gene and sort of, in this case, break the gene, if you will. So we understand a fair amount of the rules, especially in the coding region of the gene, as it's called, but we don't know all the rules. And so there are many ways to break something, and not all of them we can identify. So I think the other option is, is a lot of times there'll be a, a variant that, that they don't even find because they don't sequence that part of the gene, or we, because we don't know how to interpret even if we found something, a, a base change there. I think the third option, is there another CCM gene, and you and I, Amy, were just talking about this. It's impossible to say that there isn't, but there's no evidence as of right now that there is another gene. That the fact that people don't have a mutation found in a diagnostic lab is not evidence of another gene. There has to be some other kind of evidence to say there is evidence of another gene. That kind of negative data happens all the time in science and it happens in diagnostic labs. It does not mean that there is another gene. So I'm not saying that there isn't another gene. I'm saying that there's no evidence that sure. there is one sure. until someone comes up with some evidence. Perfect. Thank you. That's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us about mice. I know you've got lots and lots of mice on lots of different treatment regimens right now. Um, can you just in broad brush strokes, can you tell us about what you guys have going on mouse-wise? Yeah, we have so many mice. <laughs> um, I think we have like uh, I think we're, I think we're pushing four or five hundred cages, and each cage would be, you know, have a, a different number depending on whether they were breeding or this or that. Um, in broad brushstrokes, some of our mouse studies are involved in trying to understand what's going on as the mo um, molecular events that are going on during the lesion, during the cerebral cavernous malformation, the malformation itself. What's going on? 
what kinds of molecular and cellular events are going on to create that mulberry appearance or that lesion. And so those are very, you know, mechanistic studies. They're very detailed. They're important in the long run, but they don't necessarily immediately have a, a clinical uh, or a therapeutic context right away. We do, however, have a huge number of our studies are, in fact, pre-clinical drug studies. So we're studying some off-the-shelf drugs in our models. Mm -hmm. We're studying some novel therapies with um, bioaxon that you know very well, Amy, uh, a company that has a, a new compound that could become a new drug. So um, uh, we have a lot of mice on various drugs or experimental compounds. Great. And we'll see you know, which ones come up. I would say this, a drug that works in the mouse may or may not right. work for the human situation. I, I can't imagine if it doesn't work in the mouse, it's not going to work in the Sure. Human. I think that's a fair, a fair statement. That is very would you, I think you'd agree with that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, we're we're excited to see. Yeah. Yeah. no, we're excited to see how some of these uh, studies finish up here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we'll be talking about some of them um, in the Angioma Alliance uh um, scientific research conference in three weeks. later this month. Yeah. Gosh, it's already October. Yeah, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank you. Um, and just last question. You know, the patient community is obviously very, very eager for clinical trials. That's the next great thing for, from the clinical side of things. What about basic research? What are your biggest unanswered questions? Where is that black hole still remaining for CCM research? Well, one really big black hole is that. There's been so much good study uh, and good research going on, good studies by really good groups coming from different approaches and different angles. And essentially, they've nominated all sorts of ideas for the ultimate pathogenesis, the ultimate thing wrong is, and then they'll say, oh, it's rogue kinase signaling, or this, or that, or reactive oxygen species, you, you know. And then we have all these ideas. And in some cases, we have even some evidence that maybe in some kind of experimental setting that altering that pathway may have some benefit. But what we don't know is how that all fits together. Sort of we have a, you know, this rich list of, you know, catalog of ideas, and, and they're not put together yet. And I think that's one of the big questions. Is there one central pathogenesis idea that could we would, you know, say we should hit that? Yeah. And as we were talking about earlier... The key here, though, is that even if we don't find that right away, we have so many good leads for compounds that we can study them. Like You can think of them as maybe there's ultimately way up at top of something wrong, and it trickles down, and it, it branches out into different ways of, of, of causing problems with the blood vessels. But we can attack at those levels and try to fix that, even if we don't understand the big picture at the front end. So, But I think that fitting it all together, that's, all together. that's the million dollar question. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and look forward to sharing this with the NGMA Alliance patient community. Okay. Thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.